Hi, everyone. I'm John Gallant, Enterprise Consulting Director with Foundry. And I have this wonderful opportunity today to speak with Arthur Hu, who's Global CIO and Chief Technology Officer with the Solutions and Services Group at Lenovo. And we're going to be talking about the evolving role of the CIO. And I think this is, is a fascinating conversation because Art has this tremendous background in his global CIO role, but also taking on this new role, which is really around R&D, invention, creation of new services and capabilities. And I wanna talk about how those roles intertwine and what the strengths of the CIO and the strengths of the CTO role and how they come together. So Art, welcome. Glad to be here with you, John. Great. So Art, this session's focused on the evolving role of the CIO. And I wanna begin with some big picture insights from you on that front. We have seen at CIO, our, our CIO magazine website, we've seen dramatic changes in the CIO role through the pandemic period, including acceleration of the focus on digital transformation and digital business. How do you think the CIO role has been reshaped and what long lasting changes should we expect there? Well, John, I think the CIO role has really been evolving to have more breadth and complexity. And it's really going beyond the traditional IT uh, in the same way that digital capabilities are expanding into every aspect of the business. If I think about what it entails and what's underneath that, uh, the first thing is that it's going well beyond technology. And so CIOs are now being part of the shaping and evolving of future business models, right? whether it's thinking about how to extend the core business or it might be about incubating and helping think about what a future growth engine for the business might be. So one aspect is on the business. Secondly, I think CIOs are now more and more representing and advocating for user experience because you've got an increasing number of online channels and even the offline channels or the traditional ways of interacting, they're being augmented with technology, intelligence. And so the CIO naturally has at his or her fingertips, the data on all those services, products or offerings that are being used and understanding what are customers and users saying about the company in the real world. And that's a great cross section. Right. Each of those things is valuable independently, but they're even more powerful when put together. And then the final area is really in participating around the environmental, social and governance, uh, ESG. This is definitely farther afield from a more traditional tech-based role, but the amount of data required to formulate and execute thoughtful ESG initiatives is actually quite large. And again, this makes the CIO a natural stakeholder and partner with the business teams as companies invest more in this space. So again, uh, some interesting things and the opportunities here given how technology is developing. Yeah, I'm particularly struck by your comment regarding customer experience. We see that in our surveys and in our conversations where that role in the CIO and helping shape the customer experience and increasingly the employee experience, certainly in this world of hybrid work, that's even more of a concern these days. So Art, with all that you've laid out, what are the most important things you think CIO should be focused on right now? So for CIOs today, I think it starts with a recognition that the computing and the IT environment is more complex than ever. And so it's really critical to find what are those solutions that are simple as possible, easy to use, easy to scale, and easy to adapt as circumstances change. So what's an important corollary to this is really value capture. Let's rewind a little bit. Digital transformation is not a new term. It's been right. on the agenda for the past mm -hmm. multiple years. And by and large, companies have put their wallets where their mouths are. They've invested tens, hundreds, even billions of dollars into this broad umbrella of digital transformation. And that was a while ago, and it's been ongoing. So if you think about the journey, when we first started, a CIO could ask for time. Well, you need to give me a year. You need to give me two years. You need to give me three years to show results. But as those months turn into quarters and those quarters turn into years, then you actually have to deliver. So otherwise you're risking stranded investments, you're risking disenchantment from the business about, boy, we're putting in a lot of capital expenditure. Where are the outcomes? So I think uh, first on the menu is recognizing that the, the, the value of the technology that you've been invested in really needs to be obvious. 
the second point is then at the same time about building resiliency. I think the volatility uh, and the uncertainty in today's global environments are at a high point for the last decade, at a minimum. So yeah. I think everyone's pretty aligned that operating models have to not only handle today's known, but they really have to be fit to operate in a wider range of scenarios in the future. So I think that's about resiliency. And then thirdly, I think it's about building that enterprise agility, not just agile software teams, but helping turn the company into one that can go more quickly at speed. It's related to uncertainty, but it's a different dimension on resiliency. Right? Resiliency is being able to handle uncertainty. Agility, I think, is for companies that are even more forward-leaning and really able to identify where is the opportunity shifting to, right? where are value pools, profit pools shifting to. And if you can act quickly, or at least more quickly uh, than the industry or your competition, right? that's how you're going to not just survive, but really thrive. So I think it's really about the value capture, given we've been underway broadly across the industry and in many companies for transformation, uh, the resiliency to weather the unknown. And then I think the, the agility is what helps you navigate through it. Yeah, and I want to go drill down a little bit. I want to ask if, if you could, Art, could you talk a little bit more about the resiliency? What's key to being resilient? So the key for resilience is, I think, having long-term architecture, one, right? and I'll talk more, more about that in a second. And then secondly, planning, using that longer planning horizon to build health and I want to call reserves, or we'll call them shock absorbers. And let me just give you an example. Um, I, I think resilient means planning for a, a wider range, or at least widening the aperture of the lens in which you look at the world. It's not just the world as it is today, but recognizing the world is probabilistic. And besides what's actually happening, other things might happen. If we go back to the start of COVID and how Lenovo responded when everyone suddenly 50,000 people around the world need to go from working in the office to working at home. If you've never thought about that, right? if you've never designed your network to be able to handle 10x, 20x the traffic, if you haven't thought about your VPN and how do you handle right, 50 times the traffic you ever did, it was unlikely. Right? There were companies that were down for days, weeks, right? unable to really get people working up to full speed. Um, but for us, because we had planned, we said, well, we need to be able to build in you know, up and down, we need to be able to build in scalability on the network uh, because it's not just today, right? We, we're going to grow, maybe we'll shrink, maybe we have burst capacity for times when people uh, might need more. Uh, we actually ended up with a much better architecture that allowed us to dynamically allocate. Now, of course, no one knew COVID was going to happen because right? obviously this is not about predicting the future. It's about well, how can you respond better and tolerate the unknowns? So in this case, some longer term planning, uh, really in terms of thinking about scenarios that could happen and investing a little bit more about building an architecture that's more fault tolerant and scalable is well worth the while. This one, John, I think it's, it's, a, it's an excellent question on your point, because I, I think one of the other broader lessons coming out of the pandemic also as a business lesson is really that pure efficiency or efficiency taken to an extreme may not be good because if you're, that means you're optimized, but with a very narrow focus. If anything changes, right, so I think the famous just in time, well, that's perfect if the supply chain operates at 100% as you planned. But if just in time means you have no inventory and suddenly your suppliers can't ship, well, the person who did have inventory and who was maybe, hey, that looks like a liability on the balance sheet, they're actually more resilient. Right? And that's a kind of shock absorber. That makes sense. So Art, I want to talk about um, this new role that you took on within Lenovo earlier this year, within you know, the CTO role within the solutions and services group, because I think this path is fascinating. So I want to ask you to share how that evolved and tell me how your work leading IT created that opportunity as well as new business opportunities for the company. Yeah. So again, as a preface to that, it's is uh, an ongoing journey. I, I started in the CTO role for the Solutions and Services Group in Lenovo about a half year ago. So it's very much something that uh, I continue to do and learn at the same time. Uh, stepping back a bit, I think uh, when I started in the CIO role, right, the topics such as digital transformation and business agility were top of mind. Um, and you know, as time went on, as I was able to work with the team and deliver for the company, we're always looking at how to bring together 
the technology fluency uh, with the business insight. And I think it's that duality uh, where, as we thought about the future and our so-called SSG, uh, Solution and Services Group, uh, needed more of that blend. And so the CIO and the CTO role are taking on the additional CTO role was a natural extension of that. I, I, th I think there's probably three things that uh, kind of would form the theory of the case, right? As we were thinking about, well, why could this make sense? Um, the one is that as the uh, CIO, I was already building capabilities. The second one is delivering services. Uh, and then the third one is to the last part of your question, uh, which is how does that create business opportunities? Um, so let me maybe run through each of those in turn, mm. at least at a, at a high level. Um, on the creating and building capability side, the insight was I was already creating capabilities for one customer. That customer just happened to be called Lenovo. And mm. the nature of those capabilities, um, think about how do we do quoting for our salespeople? How do we make our partner portal frictionless? And how do we make our supplier portal great for collaboration with our extended ecosystem of level one, level two, level three suppliers. For years, IT just has been thinking day in, day out, how do we analyze these complex scenarios and turn them into code and software right, and create innovative solutions where we've seen gaps? So that was part one. We're already creating capabilities. Part two, we also deliver services. Now Lenovo is up to 70,000 employees worldwide. Uh, and we deliver 24 by 7 by 365 IT services, quality, reliability, and responsiveness. And so the second insight was by doing this, again, which ha happens to be Lenovo, but we have the knowledge and the frameworks in that institutional muscle that's really aligned with the solution and services group mission. So those are the first two parts of the case. And then where it really came together nicely, at least it, from an opportunity perspective, is something we refer to within the company as Lenovo powers Lenovo. And so this is where we get into, we do it in IT, but it also ties in with business opportunity. And this was almost coincidental, right? I think this was one of those, we pursued some threads, right? We did some incubation and we listened very closely to our customers and tried to stay close to the marketplace. Uh, let me give you an example. Lenovo, well, like many companies, almost all large companies, we run a hybrid cloud. We have our own on-premise deployments. We have a private cloud, but we also use multiple public clouds in China, as well as in the rest of the world. Now, it just so happens that as our sales teams were making the rounds with customers, we started being asked by a lot of companies who were looking at Lenovo and looking to learn, who said, how do you guys manage your cloud? Right? And they, we, we would try to give a sales pitch. And they say, no, 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 don't try to sell me. Just, can you just show me what you do? And then the IT team would get a call. They were like, hey, this customer wants you to, can you just demo the system and show them what we're doing? And so we followed that thread for a while and we found customers. There was one customer who literally said, their, their CIO just pointed and said, hey, I want just whatever put me on screen. I want that part of what you're managing. Yeah. How specifically it was the configuration management database, CMDB. But he said to his team, I just want to buy that. I just want to, can I just buy that part? And so we had enough of these conversations where we said, huh, there was a bit of a light bulb moment that and kind of went on a little bit over time. Like I said, somewhat serendipitous, but customers ended up wanting to pay for stuff that we were building. We're like, well, that's kind of neat. So why don't we, right, from there, why don't we think about how do we productize it formally and commercialize it rather than, hey, just this was a one-off and hey, that was good luck. Um, but that was really the beginning of Lenovo powers Lenovo, which is we do something that works really well for us. And then there's customer interest in saying, hey, that's kind of a service or a solution that we could use. Uh, and so I think with that insight, and then we started to build this bridge between IT and also the business. And that's also all part of what pointed the way towards why a CTO role made sense, which is, hey, we're doing these things. They seem to have applicability. Oh, and look, there's a bridge. We can build this bridge that says there's commercial interest and it draws on all the same yeah. skills, building capabilities, delivering services right, at quality, at scale for customers. So I know that was a little bit more involved, but I think those were the kind of the theory of the case and a little bit of practice on it. So, so in essence, IT becomes both the innovation center in terms of developing a capability for use internally, but then the proving ground as well to show that it works. And then that can be handed over to the, to the solutions group to deliver. Exactly. You got it. 
that makes perfect sense. So I'm interested to know how did your how does your background as a CIO shape that new CTO role, and then what are you learning in the new role that's shaping your work as a CIO? Yeah. So and this is a fascinating question, John, because I actually went at it the other way. Um, I think the first part of your question is tied pretty closely to why this made sense, right? Deliver right. services, building capabilities. And so underneath this, a lot of it is around software and integration and putting different pieces of capabilities together to deliver an outcome. So I knew that part in terms of building the case, those would be the things that are in common. I actually, on what's different and what I'm learning, I actually made it an explicit point to, because I, I kind of actually went through an exercise of writing down my assumptions of what makes a good CIO and what I learned in the last five years that I've been Lenovo CIO. Uh, and then I actually explicitly tried to either validate or cross them out right, uh, as I went along. Cause I didn't want, I, I knew it would be dangerous to assume, oh, I'm just picking up another IT team. Uh, and so the, that's, I think has helped me accelerate the learning journey by not making hidden assumptions. Right. Now, specifically a couple of things really jump out at what's different and what I've learned. I think there's an even stronger, we, we just spoke in, in, uh, on one of your very good questions about uh, the CIO being a natural advocate for experience. In addition to all that, I think there's an even higher premium and requirement that CIOs, uh, sorry, in the CTO role that we're very externally facing. Right. right? Uh, so I, I, you know, I found I've had to spend, and I, and I love it, right? spending more time with our partners uh, spending more time with our customers because they are excellent uh, providers of input, right? As well as intelligence on what's happening and where things are likely headed. Uh, so I think the the external to internal ratio of time spent is much higher on the CTO side because it's a very business leaning and business oriented role. The other part I think was a total mindset shift that takes a lot of time getting used to is a sea change in how you have to make the case for work. And what I mean by that is, if you're in a CIO role, it's a typically a corporate function, right? And everything is business case driven. So you want prioritization, right? How much benefit, how much quantitative, how right. much non-financial benefit, all that. The, what's different about the CTO world is your baseline is zero, right? Meaning in the CIO role, people say, well, you have a run budget and you have a transform budget, right? Let's try to optimize and prioritize. In the CTO world, supporting the business, when you're building the offerings, if you can't make the case, your budget is zero. You do nothing because people don't buy into the vision or we don't believe in the future together. And so I think there's a, a, need, a much sharper line that underscores that you really have to be very articulate and you have to do a lot of lead work, not only on the technology side, it's not enough to say, well, this is an interesting piece of technology, but from there to, well, how do you draw the line in a compelling way with the business GMs and the managers who are leading the business say, let's go build this together. It's not the difference between why well, I do, instead of 10 projects, I do eight projects as we prioritize. It's if people don't believe in the vision and we can't get aligned, you don't do anything because you're not gonna build something that ultimately you don't believe the company will be able to uh, excite our customers about. So I think those things are just, again, it's I continue to learn, but those things have definitely uh, jumped out at me as very different. So much sharper focus on customers, spending a lot more time on the external market sensing and interaction side. So, Art, you know, I'm, in my conversations with CIOs, I hear more of them talking these days about how their companies are, in essence, becoming cloud companies as they innovate around new subscription-based services for their own customers. What advice do you have for those CIO leaders about envisioning and developing these as a service offerings and then supporting them going forward? So I think this one has a lot to do, if you think about a classic, you know, from how do you get from here to there? A lot, the first point is where are you starting? And as a service is a very sexy term. Right? Many companies that are do have historically done products or sold you know, products in perpetuity are trying to shift to as a service or some variant of it, like a subscription right. model or um, and so I think the first thing to understand is how close is your company to that already? If you're already doing some parts of it, then I would argue your journey is actually much easier. Um, and so understanding your starting point, because your first challenge uh, is going to look very different in your first wave if you've never done it or it's been a very small part of your business versus, well, it's kind of an adjacency and we do a lot of it. 
Lenovo is actually an example where we were much less mature about offering solutions and services. And so the first point for us was not, well, how do we just sassify everything? It was, right, we needed to do a good hard look and in inventory of what do we actually have? And it turns out on my IT role, in my CIO role, I have to help the company build an entirely new set of infrastructure, processes, tools, and system. Because selling a ThinkPad or selling a Think server is totally different than saying, well, let me build you on a pay as you go uh, offering for yeah, storage. Right? Sure. Totally different. None of those things exist. The Salesforce capabilities are not where they need to be. Our partners need to be, uh, right, need to be along with us in the journey. So that's the first one. What's your starting point? Um, then as you go from there, I think the discussion naturally follows. Right? So you don't, you don't want to, out of the gate, misunderstand where you were, right? Because if you believe, oh, I just I can just add something to my catalog versus, oh, I need a three-year journey to write a whole new set of core systems to enable a services business, which is more where Lenovo fell, uh, your journey looks very different. Now, beyond that, I think the point is uh, thinking about, because once you think about as a service, the discussion yeah. around cloud inevitably comes uh, as well. And so I think it's useful to think about cloud computing as a tool to increase your speed and agility, right? It provides a broader set of capabilities and it helps you go faster than if you have to assemble all the capabilities from the ground up. Right? The cloud, you know, public clouds and, and even well done private clouds can help you address elasticity, right? They right. can provide pay as you go and it'll help you get more, go, uh, help you get the business going more quickly. I think uh, ultimately it's important not to lose sight of the fact that it has to be thought through on the business side. Right? If, if any IT or any CIO team is saddled with, hey, go make the SaaS happen, then I would be very afraid because I think that's an indicator that the business is thinking about it the wrong way. No amount of deployment to any cloud or IT trying to make SaaSify or make something as a service, right? that's not going to save you if it's not well thought about thought out about yeah, the function, the, right, the pricing, it, yeah. how do you support it? So I think... Yeah. Right, Understanding where the journey is, right? understanding how cloud computing capabilities can help you accelerate, and then making sure it really is uh, together with the business. Right? There are some that I definitely see that say, well, let's just, hey, IT, just go make it as a service. And that's actually fundamentally misunderstanding the challenge at hand. So Art, we just have a couple minutes left and I wanted to ask, since this is the future of cloud conference, I would be very neglectful if I didn't expand on the point you just made about cloud. How is cloud helping your team and Lenovo achieve the goals that you've set out? How does it help on both the operational front and the innovation front? Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, I think we just went through an example about the innovation front. But conceptually, I think of cloud as it's a great tool to the toolbox to expand the range of options available to you. It is not an all in one solution, and there is nothing magical about it. There's no cloud dust, like we said. Uh, you can't sprinkle, oh, hey, put this in the cloud. Maybe it'll become a SaaS product or it'll become an as-a-service. Uh, and so the good news is I, I think uh, it took my team a bit of time. And I think most uh, companies are now really getting beyond the marketing hype right? as we figure out where cloud is useful and where it's not. Right? Uh, and because people have seen how their cloud investments have played out. Now, specifically uh, on the operational side, I think it provides good dynamic resources during peak periods, when those peak periods are orders of magnitude beyond your baselines, right? So again, I think we're familiar. Think double 11 in China or Black Friday in the US. Uh, I think you know we've used operationally cloud resources uh, to have consistent functionality and availability around the world, right? When we need close to customer deployment in places where maybe we don't have on-premise facilities or in-house facilities. Uh, and I also find operationally, it's actually a very good tool because the business hears about it. And so a, a third value source is that it often triggers a discussion about, well, should, what is the future of this application, right? Is it time in the life cycle where we can re-architect it and make it better fit for a purpose? And sometimes just having that question about the cloud triggers the right discussion. So operationally, we found these use cases and patterns that have been helpful for us. Uh, your second question, oh, innovation. So on the innovation front, I think it really is about speed and agility and delivering capabilities. Um, and that's important because once you decide what you wanna optimize for, you also choose what you're not. And I, and I mentioned this because we're also learning and I think CFOs are unlearning the, hey, cloud is just cheaper. It's not necessarily, right? So if you want speed and agility, 
you're actually paying for those things because you can go more quickly. You can get more, whatever it is, right? Standard templates, uh, you know, the right security patterns, security as code, containerization for workload portability, whatever it is that you want, right? You're typically able, if you want to optimize for speed and agility, uh, you can use the cloud uh, because they often are very fully featured, right? There's no private cloud that's going to have the breadth of functionality right. uh, that's available on the public cloud. Uh, and so in those cases where speed is at a premium, then you really want your engineering team. So like prototyping, uh, you want them thinking about the business problems. You don't want them thinking about, well, how can I orchestrate more containers, right? How can I think right. about disaster recovery, right? Oh, is it in the right country for data localization, right? And so I think speed and agility is important. And I think, uh, you know, again, this is an example where because it's a pretty active space uh, on the innovation, I, I, we just spoke about how some of IT's originally internal use cases turned into, uh, we incubated them and turned it into a, a business group, right, by solving our own challenges around hybrid cloud management, right? So I think in some cases, it also leads to companies saying, hey, we have interesting capabilities here, uh, or right, you're able to identify new opportunities to pivot towards. So I think both on the operational and the innovation front, it's been very impactful, but it's also clear that you need to walk in with eyes open of what cloud is and isn't good for to get yeah, that sense. Our, our time is up. I knew this discussion was gonna be great. You did a terrific job sharing great perspectives on the changing role of the CIO around innovation, around how to capitalize on cloud and what it takes to really become kind of your own cloud provider. And I just want to thank you for those insights and for all the ideas that you shared today. Art Hood, thank you so much. Thank you, John. Appreciate the thoughtful questions.